It's my pleasure to uh, introduce our uh, next uh, uh, keynote speaker, Luba Iliuk. It's a pleasure to have you today, Luba. Luba is a, a curator, producer, and researcher specialized in artificial intelligence in the creative industries. She is currently working to educate and engage the wider audience about the latest developments in creative AI through uh, talks, exhibitions, uh, and tech demonstrations at venues across the art, business, and technology spectrum, including photography gallery, uh, Victoria and Albert Museum, ZKM, uh, and, and I think Impact Festival, and uh, many others. And also, this also includes uh, top machine learning venues, including uh, NeurIPS and ICCV. She has been con consistently contributing to organizing the creativity workshop, for example, at NeurIPS, and, and also similar workshops at ICCV. Uh, her recent uh, projects include the Art the AI Festival, the online gallery AIArtOnline.com, and, uh, and uh, as I mentioned, the New York's Creativity and Design uh, Workshop. She's an honorary uh, senior research fellow at the University College uh, London Center for Artificial Intelligence. And before that, she worked in startups, including uh, Art Collector Database, uh, Larry's List. And she obtained her uh, undergraduate degree in modern uh, languages at the University of Cambridge and has a certificate in design thinking from uh, the Hassel Plattner Institute uh, School of uh, Potsdam. And with that, uh, take it away, uh, uh, Luba, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Mohammed, for the very thorough and detailed introduction. And of course, for the invitation to be here, to be part of this event. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, to give the last sort of a uh, keynote today. I hope you can all hear me okay. And uh, right now I'm going to yeah share my screen and uh, yeah, we can start with the presentation. Right, so yeah. So my talk today will be about AI in contemporary art practice. I know you've had like two talks today already, but I think that the last one was quite philosophical. And I know Ahmed El Gamal has lots of kind of his own projects that um, yeah he he's developed. So um, yeah, in my talk, I will give uh, an overview of uh, what's been happening in AI art kind of over the over the past few years. And um, yeah, I actually start off with a few images that um, can help you understand where I'm coming from. So, uh, uh, so th this uh, th these two images they show the work of Mario Klingerman and Jake Elves at uh, at an exhibition I curated at the Leverhulme Center for Future of Intelligence in Cambridge. So back in 2017, they're so kind of displaying this art in the very kind of historical setting of of a Cambridge library. And I've done um, Impact Festival in Utrecht, uh, Netherlands. And um, Impact is one of these kind of organizations that I think likes to kind of really think about, um, yeah, media, art, and its kind of social and political significances. So at the festival, I did focused on, um, yeah, fake news. And uh, yes, as Mohammed mentioned, I've been kind of running these uh, workshops at NeurIPS um, that kind of help engage the technical community with, um, with kind of uh, artistic work and, and promote it to broader audiences. And yeah, if you haven't, um, if you haven't had a look at this website, aiartonline.com, I do recommend it because it's something I've curated as part of the NeurIPS workshops and it is quite, um, Quite a good overview of sort of uh, what's what's been happening in the AI art space over over the years, and um, yeah, now I'll uh, move on to the kind of I guess the actual presentation or the artistic works, and um, yeah, I think my interest in this space, and I also think almost kind of the interest of uh, the mainstream in the space starts with Deep Dream, which is. Uh, a technique that came out of Google in, um, I think it was 2015 now. So yes, yeah, it feels like quite a long time ago now, but um, yeah, the, the public and the journalists were kind of very excited by it because 
as you can see, it's kind of, it's, it's very colorful and it has its own aesthetic uh, style. And uh, lots of artists were kind of um, working with it. And um, there's, uh, yeah, there's this video with uh, Memo Akten. And you can kind of see that, um, yeah, it kind of starts off with, with his normal face. And then you've got these like, you know, uh, crazy colors that, um, that appear and odd shapes. I'll see if I can, um, if you, I can play it again so you can see it. And yeah, so the way this works is that the algorithm kind of looks at the image and it, it gets excited by kind of certain features and that's where kind of all these colors and strange shapes come from. And yeah, I think it provoked kind of a lot of excitement, uh, yeah, uh, back in the day and it inspired, I say, a lot of artists to get into this space. And uh, yeah, one of the artists who still, I think, quite actively uses Deep Dream is Daniel Ambrosi. And um, I really like to highlight his work because I think with the technique, with, with a technology like Deep Dream, as you can see, it's kind of, um, yeah, almost like very bright and uh, colorful. It's quite overwhelming. But uh, what Daniel Ambrosi does is um, he kind of, he combines it with his uh, computational photography skills and in, in this image here, you can kind of still see the, the original kind of background. So it's a scene by lake with some trees and there are some houses in the background, but it's got a bit of the kind of deep, deep dream aesthetic. So there are various swirls, um, the colors are a bit brighter. And now in his kind of more recent work, he's also started thinking about, okay, like how can I further develop this? And he's kind of started linking a bit more with kind of cubism and as you can see kind of uh, tiling some of these um, kind of Im images of his and yeah uh, moving on um, yeah the next thing that came along was uh, neural algorithm of artistic style or style transfer so you kind of you take a picture and then you can change it into kind of uh, into something like Van Gogh or Edward Monk and so on. And uh, yeah, Jean Pagan was kind of experimenting with it a bit. And um, I think, yeah, a while back, this was kind of the technology that people kind of thought of when you told them that, oh, I do AI art. So there was like a lot of interest in the technological community. And I remember kind of, yeah, finding it quite interesting because the technical community was very much obsessed with style transfer but if you talk to people from the art world they were quite skeptical of of this uh technique because to them it was more of a kind of pastiche right because all these kind of artists they worked like 100 or 200 years ago and they were innovating then so the work they were producing was really exciting back then but now like what's exciting is different. So you probably don't want to copy like an artist from the past. You want to kind of create something new. So there was kind of this concern from the art world. And um, and yeah, so I think artists who did want to use uh, these technology, they had to be a bit more kind of inventive. And um, yeah, one of the ways was of course to kind of look at broadening the definition of style and you know, using Google Maps or like calligraphy. And um, I know artists like uh, Sophia Crespo, they've also kind of been working with style transfer somehow with kind of minimizing, I think it was the content input and kind of working a lot on the pure style and through that kind of generating some kind of very crazy marine shapes. And um, yeah, next came uh, the GAN, um, which, uh, which, yeah, I think it still kind of dominates. And uh, I guess it's, uh, yeah, it's a technique that, um, that excites a lot of artists because it, yeah, it, it enables you to kind of uh, generate kind of lots of different, um, yeah, lots of different images and they can be quite realistic. And this, uh, this work by Mario Kling that I'm showing now, I think it dates back from 2017. So it's already like uh, quite some time back and uh, it was kind of still one of the earlier, um, I think, versions of the GAN models that was kind of used in this project. And um, I didn't include, I think, 
the slide here, but you can you can almost see kind of in these works that sometimes I guess the legs are like positioned in a kind of in slightly odd style. So in these kind of early GAN models, there were always kind of uh, various problems, as the technical community would call them, right? So um, sometimes if you looked at faces, you would notice that maybe kind of one eye was higher than another and maybe kind of, uh, I don't know, the mouth was, wasn't in quite the right place or kind of humans would have, humans or animals would have the wrong number of legs. So I guess from a computer science perspective, this was, uh, this was a problem. But for artists, this presented itself as an opportunity to kind of, yeah, see what the technology could do, what the kind of errors could be and how that could, could become kind of its own aesthetic. And, um, Oh yeah, so this is kind of, uh, <laughs> this is, uh, I think, some of the recent uh, state of the art. Uh, so one of the kind of style GAN networks. So you can see that it's kind of, uh, yeah, become very realistic. And of course, there are kind of all these kind of deep fakes that are being created. So um, yes, yeah, so I think artists uh, who want to use the GAN have been having to like think a lot more about how exactly they want to use the technology because in the earlier days, maybe like in, in 2017, if you were kind of one of the first artists who kind of started working with the technology, um, yeah, a lot of the work uh, you did was kind of almost interesting or unique by default. But now that uh, there's kind of more of a history of using these types of GAN models, then you have to like think, what can you do that's, that's different from everybody else? And uh, yeah, there are a number of artists uh, whose work I, I find um, quite interesting. Yeah, so uh, Mario is, uh, Mario Klingerman is, uh, is obviously great. And uh, he made this kind of um, interactive installation called the Common uh, Demoniator. And um, I think uh, if you kind of, if you use this installation, you could kind of uh, tweak the different facial features and so could others kind of um, across, um, across the, the world. And uh, yeah, through that, you could uh, see all these uh, kind of crazy generations of faces and kind of influence it in some way. And uh, then there is uh, Scott Eaton, um, who, yeah, who, who really creates some beautiful work that kind of thinks about the human form. And uh, what I quite like about him is that, as you can see kind of in this image, for example, the leg of this human, it's, uh, it's a strange shape, right? It's, it's very different from a standard kind of human leg. And so to me, he kind of combines the uh, high quality kind of uh, realism with uh, some of the earlier kind of uh, errors of the GAN technology where kind of the shapes of the legs might have been, might have been different. And then there's, uh, there's Terry Broad, who's also kind of uh, been uh, been working a lot with the technology to, to develop some of his own um, uh, yeah some of his own models and uh, in this project called um, yeah teratome he's been kind of inserting um, yeah filters in the higher layers of kind of the gam model to kind of twist the image uh, formation pro process and the earlier inclination and um, yeah, so the end result is that he's got these uh, highly detailed image, uh, imagery, but there is still kind of parts of it that might be kind of blurred or, or done in a very kind of different um, fashion that has kind of his own artistic imprint. Um, yeah, Golan Levin and Ling Dong Huang have a project called Ambigrammatic Figures. Which, uh, which I find quite interesting because again, it's kind of looking at, at the face and um, yeah, what you, what you can do with it. And um, I think in the 18th and the 19th century, there was this concept of these ambigrammatic figures where, which, which is basically like a face that is uh, legible kind of both ways. So as you can see, it kind of turns and um, yeah, it, you, should, you should be able to recognize it as a face either way. And, Again, I think that's uh, that's kind of interesting, and it kind of draws on again onto the history of kind of depicting faces. Um, 
Yeah, then uh, there is, uh, yeah, there, there are quite a few artists who have been working with, uh, with deep fakes and uh, Libby Heaney is one of them. So uh, she has uh, a project called Euro Revision, which was done um, a few years back now, um, just around the time when England was kind of leaving the EU and uh, the artists got uh, two, yeah, kind of deep fake versions of two politicians kind of speaking in kind of Dada poetry and dancing like Eurovision style. Um, yeah, to kind of highlight almost the fact that kind of this, uh, the situation has become um, almost like a circus uh, in the way that it's so ridiculous. And yeah, I think this is kind of one of the more, um, yeah, one of the more interesting uh, deep fake pieces to me. So I'll just play, play a little bit. Uh, it hopefully loads because I think it's, it's from, from YouTube. Yeah, so I hope this gives you an indication. I think you can find the whole clip on, um, yeah, on, 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 on YouTube. And um, yeah, I'll kind of move on to, to other works now. Um, ooh, let me pause this. Um, yeah, so another kind of interesting work is by, um, by an artist who prefers to go by kind of the, the pseudonym AI told me and um, she kind of looks at uh, kind of the, the the almost kind of the state of the art um, yeah kind of neural generation and then uh, the neurons gradually get get um, switched off on the side so actually I'll start playing it now so you can see it's kind of sort of being very realistic and then kind of the quality drops. So you can almost like recognize some of the, um, yeah, some of the limitations of the earlier kind of uh, GAN models in this. And yeah, gradually, of course, the as more and more kind of images get switched off, then it becomes kind of very, very blurry and kind of very different from the original version. So again, I think that's kind of uh, an, an interesting way of kind of looking at how you can generate faces. Um, yeah, Terry Broad again, um, not faces though. Uh, so in, in this work called uh, Unstable Equilibrium, um, yeah, so he's got two generative models uh, that are, yeah, two GANs that are uh, trying to kind of generate images without any data. So one kind of, one one of these models is kind of fed by the other, and um, again, I think it's uh, kind of it's uh, it's yeah, it's an uh, it's an unusual way of kind of uh, thinking about what you can different what you can do differently, and um, yeah, kind of thinking a lot more of on the kind of the data component, right, which influences a lot the final result and. Uh, yeah, so in this case, you can kind of see how these two, um, these two models kind of move between various um, kind of abstract colors. And, and yeah, so um, Jake Alves took, um, yeah, quite a different approach. So um, he's got, um, yeah, so he, yeah, he generated some bird images and I think also kind of uh, also some bird sounds. And then he went with an actual physical screen to, um, I think it was uh, Essex marshes. So kind of the area which has particular significance to the artist and he placed this screen. Let me just uh, play it again. Yes, yeah, so you placed the screen and uh, you probably see earlier that there were kind of all these birds in the background. 
And um, yeah, so this kind of presents an opportunity for also the birds and kind of other other, other creatures to interact with the uh, yeah with the with, with the artwork. And um, yeah, I think again, it's an uh, it's an interesting way of thinking of how like what can you do differently and how can you kind of position your artwork so that it's not also just like I don't know a video that's like on a standard screen it's kind of thinking about how you can kind of uh yeah change the visitor experience and uh also maybe kind of yeah have it interact more with its environment and um yeah so after Gans it's um I think it's really kind of the Dali and the clip that has uh, caused um, yeah, quite a bit of interest. And so these two models were released by OpenAI at the beginning of this year. And basically they kind of enable you to generate uh, images from text. And uh, there are various kind of creative coders who have been kind of building um, yeah, notebooks uh, that you can kind of use according to kind of various other um, kind of GAN models and they, Kind of bring their own aesthetics with them of course and um yeah there's uh, yeah there's quite a lot of prolific artistic work done by artists also like simon colton so these are like some images generated to the prompt of architecture's visual art and the buildings speak for themselves using kind of two different types of uh, uh to, yeah two different uh, types of models and yeah, Jean Kogan has also um, been kind of experimenting and I think this is a banquet hall. And uh, yeah, some images also from Rivers Have Wings. So another one of the artists you know, to be found on Twitter. And um, yeah, so this, this is again, uh, is another kind of model that the artists used to kind of generate these visuals. And yeah, so I think um, again, they, they have kind of uh, their own uh, kind of uh, aesthetics that you can kind of kind of uh, recognize them by. So I don't think I have included much text in, in these, but sometimes you can kind of see that the text is not rendered like legibly uh, because it's kind of interpreted as an image. And then there seems to be kind of, uh, yeah, kind of lots of things almost uh, kind of meshed uh, together in a way. And um, yeah, and I think the excitement, there's kind of a lot of excitement in using these different techniques, almost kind of reminiscent of Deep Dream, occasionally in terms of aesthetics, but also in terms of kind of uh, popularity and the community that's sort of uh, engaging with it all. And uh, yeah, now I'll go through a couple of artists who have uh, been kind of thinking a bit more about kind of the, the data part of the way they work. And um, yeah, Roman Lipsky is, is one of these artists. So this is a Polish artist based in Berlin. And normally he doesn't really do much with, uh, or like before he started working with AI, he never really did much with kind of new media. So he did a lot of kind of different paintings of, uh, Kind of landscapes and then at some point he wanted to kind of try collaborating with an AI and so there was kind of an image of this kind of LA night scene that he proceeded to paint like nine times and then he collaborated with um you yeah, know with, with a technical studio to kind of to get some images generated from those nine nine versions and um when he got these uh, images which look like this roughly. So sort of like you can kind of see where they're coming from, right? Except that there are, in, in, Lipsy's, in Lipsky's case, the color scheme is more limited, right? So it's normally kind of black and then, I don't know, red or blue or kind of yellow, but the AI generated versions got like a mix of different things. So Roman Lipsky looked at this and then he proceeded to make some of his own kind of um, images yeah, paintings in response to this. And um, yeah, these are some of the works he did. And uh, yeah, as you can see, he kind of broadened his own range of colors and uh, tried to be kind of a bit more fluid in, in his depiction of the scene. And again, these went kind of into their AI model and um, 
yeah, this is what appeared, which is kind of much more abstract and also the color choices, particularly on the left, are a bit more kind of uh, dubious. And yeah, Roman looked at it again and um, yeah, this is what he kind of, uh, what he painted in response, which is kind of also abstract and combines a couple of different colors. And uh, yeah, if you kind of look at the two of these kind of side by side, so the original images that Roman um, kind of painted and then the final abstract version, you can see that there's been kind of quite a lot of, um, yeah, stylistic development. And uh, yeah, the final version of it is kind of in some ways, it's, it's still a painting, right? So it's not um, kind of a digital screen-based thing. And uh, yeah, that's what I really like about the way kind of Roman has been uh, kind of working with the technology is that he's always kind of been a painter. He's found a way to kind of almost use these technologies to help him kind of, uh, yeah, understand his style or get like a, a, a new like creative partner who would yeah provide feedback and give ideas and help him almost to kind of uh, yeah move on uh, stylistically. And uh, yeah, so he's a great example for that. And then you've probably seen uh, different works by Anna Riddler, but uh, this is actually um, this piece, not this video, but what you'll see next is probably one of my uh, favorite works of her. And it's called The Fall of the House of Usher. And so this is actually, this is a clip of a 1929, um, yeah, black and white silent film. And yeah, I'll, I'll play it again, just so you can kind of get an idea of what it looks like aesthetically. Uh, because what Anna did was she made two or 300 ink drawings of stills from this film and then proceeded to train um, yeah, one of the GAN models on it. And again, this was like quite a few years back. So, um, and, and the data set was quite limited. So um, the results, um, yeah, might have been different now, but yeah, so you can kind of see this is like a film still on the left and one of her drawings on the right. And this is kind of the, the generated version. And I'll, I'll just pause it. And yeah, what is, uh, what is I guess, quite interesting in this uh, generated version is that um, as you watch it, um, yeah, you will notice that, that uh, a couple of things are kind of uh, unusual in a way. So yeah, first of all, so Anna as a human artist, when she kind of draws a scene, maybe like under time pressure, she would um, kind of almost like emphasize different things, right? So at some point there will be a chair that appears and reappears in the clip because I mean, as, as a background item to an artist looking to sketch a scene, maybe it's not the most important thing. So maybe in some drawings it's missing, but of course kind of an AI kind of picks up on it and kind of amplifies this mistake. And then the way Anna draws um, eyebrows and eyes is similar. So at some point you will also see how like on the face, kind of the eyes and the eyebrows um, kind of, yeah, swap, swap places. So um, yeah, if, if you watch it, you will see, so. And again, it's kind of blurry because that was like state of the art um, with pix to pix back then. So soon there'll be kind of the image with the face. Yeah, there you can kind of see how um, the eyes and the eyebrows were moving. And um, again, here kind of the artist uh, kind of looks at the finished version and has thought about kind of what it tells her about kind of her own practice and her kind of attention to detail and the way of again, kind of eyes and eyebrows moving. You kind of see how um, he has helped her kind of understand her practice better almost. And um, yeah, um, Helena Sarin is, um, is another artist who, um, who likes kind of uh, drawing and um, yeah, really thinking about uh, the data sets she kind of uses in, in her work. And um, what stands out in particular with um, with her work is that she combines different mediums. So like in the image on the right, I think it's a combination of newspaper and photography. And uh, on the left, it's um, I think pastel drawings with, 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 with another medium. And 
the images that she produces are like quite different from kind of many other artists in the field. Yeah, partly because kind of she combines these mediums and kind of she bases it off her own kind of yeah data, data collections and um, yeah she's been able to kind of stand out and really make a practice that's quite distinct through through that way. And um, yeah, um, now I'll, I'll go through a couple of um, pieces that have kind of thought more deeply about uh, maybe the concept or kind of what can be done again to kind of stand out from a lot of the other kind of AI art that's been made in the space. And yeah, Ben Snell is a good example. Um, so there haven't been too many artists working with AI art for sculpture. And uh, Ben made this sculpture called Dio. And um, yeah, this, this is based on kind of an AI generated design and uh, kind of, yeah, that, that, uh, that encompassed kind of sculpture from uh, antiquity to modernity. And uh, when the design was made, um, Ben proceeded to Kind of uh, destroy the computer. You can kind of see him making it into dust, and there's kind of the dust in the on, on the right hand side. And uh, the sculpture was kind of made from this dust, so it's kind of uh, it's almost uh, like a phoenix that rises from the ashes of all the previous sculptures. And it's got, I think, some conceptual link also to artists who work in in the first half of the 20th century and who were destroying their works. So I think this, this is kind of a very interesting like and well thought out piece on, on several different levels. Um, yeah, Sophia Crespo has also been, um, yeah, so she's been working quite a lot with the, with the natural world and thinking how you can um, generate new life forms and new creatures and what would they look like, how would they, Kind of work and she's been thinking like quite a bit about I think different ways of um, of yeah making these creatures uh, yeah as part of the um, visitor experience. So I think as, uh, as 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 yeah what I showed you in the beginning uh, at some point were some sea creatures kind of generated with uh, with I think style transfer and uh, these were images and uh, these are. Um, like artificial remnants. So these are kind of uh, 3D uh, renderings that she's made. And um, in, in exhibitions, she frequently, yeah, 3D prints them out. So you kind of see like these creatures becoming like physical out of the kind of, uh, yeah, in, uh, yeah, in the, new, the new life forms. And uh, there's also, she also has a variety of um, filters. So, if you go on her kind of Instagram page, um, sometimes there are kind of various uh, AR filters that you can kind of test when you're kind of uh, going about your your life. And um, yeah, Shun Sun Bak Kim Yang Hum. These are two artists based in um, yeah in in Seoul, and uh, they've been working with facial recognition. Um, yeah, at a kind of in a really unusual way. Um, so they they found um, artists who normally paint portraits of people, and they asked them to paint portraits together with a facial recognition algorithm. So as they were painting, uh, a facial recognition model was kind of looking at what they were painting, and as soon as it detected a face, they had to stop and do something different. So these are like some of the images so some of the portraits that were not recognized as faces by the AI. And here it's kind of interesting to see what the difference in perspective is between the machine and the AI, because of course, like in some of these as a human, you would clearly kind of see that, yes, this could be a portrait, but um, yeah, in others less so. So for example, I think in this image on the, on the left, like to me, like I also struggle to understand like, how is this a portrait unless, it's like in, in a very kind of broad sense that encompasses, I guess, the character of a person as opposed to kind of the physical form. So um, yeah, it, it also has resulted, I think, in, in a couple of quite interesting images. And um, 
when I did uh, my last nerves workshop in, uh, in, in, in 2020, this work was actually the work that um, I think was found most interesting. And um, so this, uh, this work by Matty Mariansky, and um, yeah, so it, it's a curve generator that was pitted against the facial recognition algorithm. And uh, using an evolutionary process, the curves try to be more and more kind of face-like. So um, yeah, again, kind of thinking of uh, depicting faces, not in the, in the photorealistic sense, but like with, with different tools and um, yeah, coming up with this kind of curve generator is uh, again, uh, an interesting technique. Um, no. Um, Aljo has, uh, has a work called uh, Salah, which kind of looks at her um, kind of her history of her family, of her family who were um, kind of traveling across the Arabian Peninsula. And um, the data set that the artist found, it, it was kind of mainly made by, I think, the colonial powers of the time, as opposed to depicting the kind of the views of, of, of the people. So she um, so she kind of uh, worked with an AI model that kind of erased the kind of, I guess, the colonial depictions and uh, yeah, made a set of uh, images that kind of, um, yeah, highlight kind of the absence of, um, of, 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 of the native perspective. And again, are quite different in terms of the aesthetics. Uh, Tom White has been working quite a bit with um, yeah, with object kind of uh, recognition and thinking about like what is kind of the essence of uh, a starfish or the essence of kind of the brain. Um, and uh, yes, the image on the left is uh, is supposed to be a starfish. And uh, yeah, when I look at it as a human, like I wouldn't think it's a starfish. Right, and I hope many of you would agree. But I think if you show it to a lot of the kind of object recognition models, uh, many of them would recognize it as a starfish, and to them that would kind of uh, yeah be the the drawing that would kind of uh, yeah have the have the basics for a starfish. And yeah, the image on the right is I think a brain or a cabbage, and I always kind of forget. Um, and um, yeah, Kirill Benzi has uh, has also ha has this work that kind of uh, tries to make uh, an image of flowers based on um, kind of uh, yeah, kind of lots of different categories. So you can see uh, by the side there's guinea pig, traffic light, cabbage butterfly, bell pepper, comic book, and strawberry. And uh, yeah, so the kind of the image recognition models kind of identify that. In, in the flowers and they kind of all kind of contribute to um, yeah to, to making uh, these these flowers um, yeah Sheng Sung by Kim Yang Hong have have also this work called uh, mountain which uh, kind of erases the mountains just to the basics for for the AI and again you can see it is probably quite different to what you would signify a mountain to. And um, yeah, there's also a couple of artists who yeah move away from, I guess, some of these like more uh, more popular techniques in um, in AI art. And um, yeah, Harm van den Dorpel is is one of these. So um, yeah, he's been uh, working with um, uh, yeah with a type of model that looks at uh, two. Um, yeah, two turtle drawings, and then it proceeds to kind of breed uh, images in their style, and then from then on, like it picks two two new parents, and then it kind of creates new kind of child child images. And let me just just play this uh, video again because it depicts it quite well. So as you can see in the beginning, there's quite a lot of different kind of images, and then two are picked. And um, yeah, as they kind of uh, show some of these images, 
yes yeah, and as they generate more and more images they become kind of more similar in style until kind of one artwork is is made and that is supposed to be kind of the supreme artwork and uh, i think this is frequently this at, at the time it was also a website called hybrid.bio where you could kind of go and you could kind of influence which images would be kind of uh, included and uh, yeah, Alex Modvinsev uh, also has uh, has a work called uh, Hextels, which um, um, yes, yeah, so this is an artificial self organizing system based on the neural uh, cellular automaton architecture. So there are all these cells that were trained to build diverse texture patterns through communication between neighbor cells only. So um, yeah, so it's, it's quite, quite interesting. And we actually have this work on display here in, in Leicester right now. And uh, if you go to, um, I think the artist websites and, and go on his Hexels project, you can also kind of uh, interact with it. And as you kind of move uh, your mouse on the screen, you can kind of see how the system kind of changes. And yeah, I think I'm, yeah, I'm still doing cake time. And um, yeah, uh, this work by Scott Kelly and Ben uh, Porkinghorn is uh, is kind of thinking about the recommendation system. So again, thinking I guess more broadly about what AI technologies are there and what tools can be used. And so they made these boards, which uh, kind of recommend you other theme parks, other, I mean, natural parks that you can go to, and they place them in this beautiful park in New Zealand, because, of course, when you're there, this is, um, kind of, this is, this, this is what you probably wouldn't want to see, and it kind of reminds you almost of the culture of uh, consumerism, and also kind of of our influence um, of all these kind of, uh, yeah, technology models, and again, kind of here it blocks your entry or your view of the sea, and um, and yeah, so you can kind of uh, get emphasized how it blocks your um, enjoyment of life. And I think, yeah, I'm probably gonna speak for like maybe five, five, five or some more minutes and then uh, there will be some time for questions, I hope. But yeah, um, now in the, in the last part, I'll just go over some works that think more critically of AI systems and particularly of facial recognition. And Adam Harvey's been doing kind of a lot of great work, kind of just surprising some of the weaknesses in these systems. And um, yes, yeah, so this is, I think, from 2015. So again, some time back. And at that point, if you had these kind of squares on your face, you would kind of uh, not be recognized as a, as a face. Also, if you had a wacky hairdo, you wouldn't be recognized. Um, and then I think he kind of, as, as these, uh, facial uh, de detection systems, uh, facial recognition systems became um, kind of uh, better. Um, Adam Harvey has kind of looked at different techniques. So there's the hyperface, uh, which was, I think, kind of trying to mesh the face into the background. And then there are other artists who've been making kind of jewelry that you can kind of wear on your face that again would protect you from being recognized. and. I think this is this is a very kind of beautiful piece by Eva Novak. Then there's um, artists or designers like Kate Rose who've been kind of making these dresses that kind of uh, try to um, yeah, almost kind of pollute the data that is gathered by all these uh, um, yeah video surveillance cameras, so that uh, yeah they would get confused and. Uh, yeah, there's also kind of Sergio Venancio who was, um, who was again trying to like figure out which text with which gestures would prevent uh, a face from being recognized. So, yeah, I think there's been quite a lot of interest in this field, um, particularly with kind of with the events of the past few years. And um, yeah, there's there's a lot of activity, and. Um, yeah, so Lauren McCarthy, she's been looking at, um, at, at, at the topics of uh, kind of surveillance and um, home assistance and uh, from a very different perspective. So 
Uh, many of us have an Alexa or kind of a Google Home or whatever they're called device in, in our homes. And I guess these uh, take on the device of almost kind of the household manager, right? So whether that's you know, the woman of the house or like uh, additional help, and they, they frequently might um, um, kind of, yeah, change the volume of the music or switch the lights off, or they kind of, they're very kind of intrusive in the, in terms of the uh, presence in a way, or anyway, that's kind of what the artist um, might've felt. And um, what Lauren McCarthy did was she kind of, uh, she decided that she would be the, uh, the kind of the human version of, of an Alexa. So she kind of, uh, let me see. So she kind of sat, um, yes, yeah, behind her computer, and she had access to uh, somebody's kind of house, and she was able to um, to make all these kind of things happen. So to change the temperature or switch off the lights, and uh, she kind of almost was becoming like an Alexa. And I think this also became uh, a museum piece called uh, "Someone Where." kind of you as a, as a user could um, can, could kind of um, work with um, with these work with these systems and through that kind of uh, almost like intrude into kind of somebody else's um, home who like willingly allowed you to kind of uh, control the temperature and um, and so on and again I think it's also like a great way to kind of raise awareness of the way these devices are kind of becoming part of our lives and how they're you know, making, they're maybe taking away some of the functions that were previously reserved um, for other kind of uh, individuals and so on. And uh, yeah, I think uh, at this point, I'll probably end my presentation. Oh yeah, this is, wait, yes, this is an example of kind of someone, so of one of these like humans who is kind of, um yeah acting within the system and, and changing somebody else and yeah so i'll end here if you have any questions or anything you can always reach me by email or twitter and i think there is a little bit of time for questions right now yeah thank you so much uh for that inspiring uh talk and that's a great overview over like the current and past developments on that subject um, if there is any questions, we do have time since uh, this is our like last talk for tonight. So everyone, please feel free. You can put it in the chat or even raise your hand if you want. Well, I would have a question if there is none yet. Um, so uh, my question is, it's a quick, it's kind of a panel like question in this uh, topic for, for me because I talk I think about that so much but um, what would you say is your personal view on this issue of authorship in the cooperation between artists and, and technologies like AI for example um, and, and I mean it for not projects like with uh, Roman Lipsky who uses like AI as a muse, for example, in what you presented, but more likely in this cooperation between artists and machine in that case. Hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. And I think kind of a lot of people are still kind of thinking about uh, how it should be defined and what's the best way to go about it with, uh, of course, with all these new tools. And um, yeah, I think, in general, to me, it's really kind of the artist who um, who comes up with the idea, and uh, yeah, uh, of course, artists have very very different ways of kind of working with the technology and the execution. So there might be some who would kind of go on one of these websites where you can kind of easily generate an image from your data. And there they do kind of very little work and probably also very little kind of conceptual um, development. And I think a lot of the interest in that work relies more in the kind of technology that, again, was developed by somebody else. But I think these projects are kind of rarely kind of uh, exhibited so much now. And so there are kind of less discussion about them. 
And then I guess on the other side of the spectrum, you do have kind of all these artists who kind of think more carefully about data. And um, yeah, I've seen kind of the way the artists kind of present their work, they would frequently kind of write the model that they use. But um, I think the data set is the part that is not always kind of uh, made, uh, made clear. So I know artists like Anna Riddler and Helena Siren, they're very kind of particular about the data they use and it's frequently their own. But for many kind of other artists, it's not even always kind of clear what, where the data set came from or sometimes it's always like from Flickr, but again, like what is it and do they have the rights and, and so on. So um, yeah, I think uh, it is uh, yeah, it is tricky in a way. Yeah, and so as I said, I do think it's kind of it is mainly the artist, but uh, uh, yeah, but it, it, I think it probably depends on also the conceptual strength of the work because if it is like conceptually weak, then um, then I guess the novelty or the interestingness is brought more by the technology kind of developer um who yeah who created um the model so so yeah um <laughs> it's, a, it's a difficult one yeah i just remembered um harold cohen as well said I, I i wrote the code so basically it's 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 my work of art um but yeah i i do agree and i want to uh, give you like the question that's uh, in the chat from arnab and it says, um, he asks, once AI becomes more mainstream, will there be more collaborations between artists and scientists? Okay. Yeah. Is AI not mainstream enough yet? <laughs> <laughs> like certainly working in this field, to me, it feels like uh, the past couple of years, I've seen like so much interest with AI. There's been like so many museum shows there are like more and more opportunities for artists also to kind of sell their work like at auctions galleries and like kind of this like nft space now and um yeah so i think certainly a couple of years ago um it was super important for artists i think to collaborate with scientists because it was so kind of tricky to get one of these models to kind of do what you wanted it to do right because the technology was very freshly developed and there were kind of fewer tools available. But now I think uh, if you don't know much about AI and you kind of want to start working with it, there's Runway, there's lots of different websites that kind of really help you to kind of generate uh, kind of images or text or so on. So you don't necessarily need to collaborate with a, with a scientist so much. But um, I, of course, would like to see kind of more of these collaborations between artists and uh, scientists because kind of this way you could see some new technological models being developed or kind of new ways of thinking from, from the scientist or from the discussion between the artist and the scientist that, uh, that would arise. Um, so yeah, it would be good to see more of them. Well, uh, thanks, Luca, for the inspiring talk. Where do you think the current AI technology needs to be developed the most to be help to be more helpful for artists and designers or maybe creative industries in general? Hmm. Yeah, why should it be developed? Um, yeah, that's um, yeah, it's a good uh, it's a good question. And sometimes when I kind of um, yeah, when I think of this question. Um, it feels like, um, yeah, when, when the GANs were still being developed, when they still hadn't reached kind of realism, like the scientists thought that like the realism is what the artists wanted. But of course, probably at that point, if you would have asked an artist, they might have kind of given you a completely different answer because they were fascinated by the errors of the models and kind of by the things that they were getting wrong. So um, certainly there's like a group of artists who's just probably uh, kind of uh, standing by and watching what um, what kind of what the technical community is doing. And when they release a model, they're kind of out there wanting to kind of critique it and find its limitations and see where, like what can be done with it. So I think they are quite kind of open-minded. 
And then I guess if you look at um, kind of designers and uh, people from creative industries who are using kind of AI to fulfill a particular task, then um, yeah, I guess they would have kind of more specific uh, requirements. Um, yeah, I think so. <laughs> but I guess like in general, I think these groups would probably benefit from uh, kind of models that, uh, I don't know, require kind of less data or cheaper to run or kind of uh, more available kind of online or in runway and kind of easier for people who don't know much about AI to kind of start working with. I have another question um, from Verena. It's, uh, she asks, what criteria do you use to judge quality? What is innovative? What is creative? What is subversive? Yeah, again, another very kind of uh, good, um, good question, because I think uh, if I speak to some of my fellow curators in the field, they would uh, probably come up with quite a different selection of works because everybody has kind of slightly different um, ways of looking at kind of what is important. And um, yeah, so I guess I, I, I came into this field without much of a, either a historical or technological background. So I think the way I've been looking at it is kind of seeing what causes excitement from kind of the audiences and then kind of based on that, kind of looking at what are the major kind of technological advances of, and kind of the type of art that they they create and then kind of supplement that with uh, kind of some of the more critical work um, that is that is done by artists and um, yeah I guess looking at what is kind of new and uh, innovative um, and what is what is creative yeah, so I think whenever a new model is released, there are kind of lots of artists that would begin kind of working with it. And um, yeah, some projects, uh, they kind of get a lot of attention, but then after some time they fade because maybe like conceptually, they weren't kind of uh, as, as well developed. But um, I think in general, um, I kind of look at works and I would want them to have at least one, um, one thing, so either they would need to be aesthetically strong. So some of the early images I showed you like Daniel Ambrosi or Mario Klingerman. So a lot of their works are kind of, uh, yeah, they're quite beautiful. They have like quite a distinct aesthetic, but the artist is very technologically skilled and he's been able to, he or she's been able to create something that is, um, I think quite different. And then, um, yeah, there's a group of artists who think much more about kind of the concept or the data. And uh, sometimes what they have generated with AI um, is, uh, is not as of high quality as those kind of generated by the technicians. But uh, the concept is, is quite interesting. And kind of through that, it, um, yeah, it becomes important. And I think those, those are kind of the works that probably are quite popular in the more traditional kind of museum and uh, media art space. But yeah, from my perspective, it's also kind of important to, yeah, think what you can do in terms of kind of advancing the aesthetics and kind of visual depictions. All right, well, thank you. Uh, if there's any more questions, I think, uh, Luba, if you're, you still have time, we have time, I guess, but I don't see any yet. All right. Well, thank you so much to you, Luba, and to all our speakers today.